Good day, nerds, and thanks for joining us for episode two of the Nerd Cantina show. I'm your host, Ken, joined by the founder of the Nerd Cantina, Steve. In this episode, we are recapping some of the last week's recent news, as well as continuing to feature interviews from C2E2. We have an interview from renowned cosplayer Erica Fett, the creator and editor of C4 Magazine, artist Chrissy Zulo, and Brendan Lee Mulligan from the TV show Dimension 20. We have packed a lot of greatness into this episode, so stick around, nerds, and let's get to the show. Calling back all nerds. Nerds! And here we are uh, with Steve on episode two of the Nerd Cantina. We're done episode zero, uh, episode one, coming with uh, C2E2. And uh, I'm pretty proud of what, what came about episode one. So so am I. I think uh, we're on a good start. Uh, if you listen to a lot of uh, episode zeros and episode ones, if you're a fellow podcaster, some of them are pretty rough. And I think uh, we set the bar pretty high for ourselves going forward. <laughs> yeah, it, put uh, probably a little too much effort into uh, really getting ready and prep work here, but it, it comes off, I, I think we're, we're fairly well polished. I, I like what you did over at uh, C2E2. I think you've got a, a pretty good knack for keeping a conversation going and, and have an interview, and I was quite surprised by that. I had low expectations for you. I appreciate that. I still stand by the the assumption that I'm just a vocal chimp at this point. Um, I, I I see the the miles of growth that I can do myself, but having having genuine interest in what people are talking about, I think that's what comes across in the interviews. Is that that I really do care? Like I, I want to talk to these people. I want to know what they got going on, and I think that's what shows. I will start to vocally get better uh, hopefully as time goes by and cut out some of the you know stutterings and ums and ahs and my broken english you know i sound like borat at a few times there it'll it'll get better i, I i'm confident in that yeah and most of those things are nothing that uh, a, a good audio engineer can't uh conceal your ums and ahs and, and ticks uh, but uh in the end i think we're, we're having a good time and hopefully Hopefully we're finding an audience at this point, uh, people who are enjoying the conversation, starting to get an idea of the format of the show that we're trying to put together, a little bit of what kind of conversations we're driving towards. And we've got a, a lot more planned. So looking forward to where we take this thing. Yeah, I'm looking forward to throwing a little bit of the variety uh, in there in the shows. You know, once we get um, up to the double digit shows, people kind of really get a feel for the gamut of content that we're uh, trying to provide. Hey, Steve, there's, a, again, a lot going on in, in the world of, uh, of the nerd. What stood out from this last week? Well, I know one that you're excited for, me, not myself so much. They dropped the Borderlands 3 trailer this week. Um, Borderlands is a huge RPG shooter game that, that you know, was really well received for 1 and 2. I personally never got into it. I wasn't a fan of the uh, animation and graphic style. I, I started to play it for a little bit and just got lost in it, especially when you only have limited gaming time and you have other preferences. Me and Natalie, my wife, we, we loved playing Borderlands games because, one, it was still a game that allowed split-screen co-op, which that's that's what the two of us spent entire adult time gaming together uh, as a couple sitting on the couch, split screen. Very few games are actually allowing that to happen and, and doing, especially in like the RPG format. So we enjoyed that split screen. We enjoyed the animation and and it's really just turn off your brain, go level up, go shoot, go shoot a bunch of dudes in the head. Uh, and it was it was a fun game. One was great. Thoroughly enjoyed two. And then now the trailer for three comes out. One, if they get rid of split screen co op, I'm out. It's, it's no longer doing it. This is this is what <laughs> this is what I like about the game. Two, honestly, the trailer looks great. It could be DLC content for for episode two. Like it really doesn't look like there's been years since two, and it doesn't look like there's a drastic new direction or anything going on with it. Well, I think that's that's one thing they might have done on purpose. You know, if if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And border people are still playing Borderlands one and two. It's true. The the cartoonish graphic style doesn't leave that much more room for advancement. 
you know, with the dawn of 4K, the colors might be a little better, whatnot. But I, you know, they're really not going to change the the graphic style, the rate of play. Like you said, I, I, it could just be DLC for for Borderlands 2. But honestly, I think the majority of Borderlands fans, that's all they wanted. They they just wanted to carry on the story. So if that's if you're a big Borderlands fan, I think they they did it right. Then you know what I mean. Like what what are you really going to add to a game that has sold tens of millions? Millions of copies already, you know. Yeah, and the truth is, is like I said, it, as long as it's going to give me that split screen co op and it gives me an excuse to convince my wife to play some uh, co op there, then it's a win for, in my book, and I'll, I'll pick it up. Well, I think we're going way less with the solo RPGs nowadays. Uh, I think more more and more people are realizing that they'd rather play with a friend, you know. So the Tomb Raiders and and the solo RPGs are. They're still going to be around, but I really think that most game developers are trying to find a way to engage your friends. Because especially like me, when I was younger, I played a lot of the solo RPGs. You're a kid. You just want to go in your room. You don't want to listen to your parents. You don't want to deal with anything. So you just kind of wall yourself off. But being an adult, um, when I log into my Xbox, that's the time I usually use to... You know, talk to my friends, so, you know, hang out with Rami and, and all the guys and, and play a shooter or something like that. That's when I talk to my buddies more through Xbox Live than I do through text messages, WhatsApp, phone conversations. You know, we, we usually just meet up in, in the video game system. So I think I can't see them getting rid of the the co-op, you know, with the, with the way current trends are kind of going. I, yeah, but I, I'm a dinosaur in the realm that I... I still want to do co-op in the same room with somebody. I did a, a 10 day trial for Anthem and wrote a review on it for the website. It's up on the nerd cantina and it would look promising. It had its, its bugs. It had its um, downsides, you know, a lot of load time. The UI was a little hard to get used to at first. Um, but now that, you know, me and all my friends have bought the game. We've been playing it now for a few weeks. This thing is is tanking, and it has become one of the more frustrating purchases I've had on a video game in a long time. Constantly crashes. So, you know, you're in a mission with three other people. You ha- it's multimedia, so you, you can't do a mission without matchmaking. So you finally get into the, the mission, and you, you matchmake with, some, with a group of guys. And then halfway through the mission... The game crashes. I've I've just lost all my sound to where I'm just now I'm I'm playing in a mute world, you know, with, with everybody. Um and they had a big beta, they did the ten day trial. You wonder why, you know, games are pushing these games out when they're clearly not ready. So that was a big problem with Destiny. That game wasn't ready. It it seems like everybody's just rushing to market now. And just saying, let's just get the game out there, get their 60 bucks, we'll patch all the bugs, and if the game's not good enough, we'll sell some DLCs for it. You know, which is a horrible business model in the dawn of free-to-play games. You have games like Fortnite, Apex Legends, you know, PUBG, that are free. Yeah, and, you know, and there's a difference. It's these The big companies, the, the big manufacturers, they, they shouldn't be doing this. They, they have no reason to. You know, it's different when you're talking about indie game makers and stuff yeah. like that. Like, they should be pushing out as soon as they've got something viable and then fix it over time because they want to need to prove the concept and, and make profitability. But when you have these big companies, you can delay profitability in order to put together a polished product. And that should be the expectation when somebody's spending 60 plus dollars on your game and then knowing everybody now, you know, you buy a $60 game and you're expecting if you're going to play this game for more than a year, probably another $30, $40 in TLC content if you just want to keep playing it in today's market. There's there's no better way to turn me away from the game than exactly kind of what happened to me yesterday. Sunday afternoon, trying to have a relaxing day. The girlfriend goes out for shopping for a couple hours. The baby, you know, six-month-old baby goes down for an hour and a half nap. Crack the knuckles. I'm ready to go. Boot up the game. And just straight garbage. Crashes on me twice, won't boot up, can't connect to server. You know, like there is nothing that will get me to chuck my controller across the room and say, fuck EA, then then that kind of scenario. And when you have a company like EA that has, what, 
couple thousand developers under their belt, you know, that, that are pushing together a game that was highly anticipated, you know, it, it, you know, they, they hyped Anthem for a couple years and when it finally dropped, you know, they did the big betas, they did all this, like, why do they allow this sort of kind of mess to happen? Cause there's, there's, I'm telling you right now, like, this is, this is what happened with Destiny. I gave Destiny a bunch of my money. They just kept shitting on me. Never buy it again. Didn't buy Destiny 2. You know, Anthem's going to come out with DLCs and, and, and new raids and stuff like that, and, or strongholds, I like to call them. What's going to get me to pay more money to play this game when I already paid 60 and I can't play when I want to play? You know, it's, it's a huge problem I see in gaming. Well, to, uh, to shift out of, out of gaming here, we've got in the realm of other entertainment, TV and uh, movies coming up. we got some, some big releases that, that I know you're planning for, uh, planning to go see. Yeah, April's going to be uh, pretty epic. You know, so on the 5th, Shazam releases, which I had the pl- pleasure of being able to see already. Um, that review's already up on the Nerd Cantina. So that's kind of like the first one, but there a lot of people got to go see it with that pre-release. So the, the buzz is kind of already out there. I think everybody's kind of getting ready for that. I, I'm not sure why you didn't go see Dumbo this last weekend. I was going to try to take Layla. I really was. Uh, my grandma even mentioned, expressed uh, to want to go see it. I didn't have the time. I am a Tim Burton fan. Uh, I do plan on reviewing it, but that's not one of the ones I felt like I was obligated to get out before the Friday of release. You know, I think we all know the story. It's just uh, how how Tim Burton put his spin on it. I think that everyone's interested in seeing. Um, the 12th, we have what I don't think anybody's talking about, but I'm kind of excited for is the the remake of Hellboy. So... The first two Hellboy movies I thoroughly enjoyed. I'm a big uh, Guillermo del Toro fan. Yeah, Ron Perlman um, did a great job. I, I actually thoroughly enjoyed Hellboy too. When they went to kind of remaking it now, I like the Ron Perlman Hellboy. Like I, I'm questioning whether I'm going to enjoy the see, next. I, I'm drawing a blank on um, the guy from Stranger Things name. I meant to write it down before we started recording. And I forgot, but I like that actor too. You know, and I think I think that's where. Fans are going to disconnect, and I, I try not to do that when I go into movies. Is if Christopher Reeves is your Superman, you're not going to like a Henry Cavill. Like I get it, you know. If Ron Perlman is your Hellboy, you know they've done these character, you know, actor switches in in multiple renditions. The Punisher did it. If you go in the movie with Ron Perlman on the brain, you're you're probably going to have a bad experience. Like it's not going to be, it's not going to live up to everything that you expect. You you have to kind of clear the slate with these. Well, things. yeah, and I think they just have to go a different direction. So so David Harbor being the actor uh, that's not playing Ron Perlman, it it seems as though this iteration of Hellboy is going to go way way darker, more comic book, right? The the way it actually is portrayed in the graphic novels, going darker. So I imagine there's going to be you know, hey, less of the one liner is that Ron Paul Perlman was known for for the Hellboy, uh, a little more on the the lighthearted humor. They went with with a rated R movie on this one, so you just got to expect that it's going to have a more mature feel, more in tune with actual violence that you see in the comic itself. Well, and I have mad respect for any actor that's willing to get as physical with their preparation um, for these roles. Uh, you know, the, the big superhero genre, the one thing I thought was a little cheesy about Shazam is that they uh, all the muscles are pads, and it's plain as day. Yeah. It's, it's plain as day. You know what I mean? Like, like, dude looks real squishy. You know, so I I have mad respect for dude. Like, dude put in some hours CrossFit training and and just sheer you know power lifting. He got jacked for this role. Yeah, but sh- you know, the Shazam body is supposed to be a little kind of comically built. You're not making a human body like that. It's tell it's, us to Henry Cable. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure him eating chicken for six fucking months wasn't real pleasurable for him. I'm sure he might have liked a few pillows to make his chest and shoulders look bigger, but nah motherfucker, you're Superman. <laughs> Be Superman. All right. Like so I get Zachary Levi has his limitations, but you know, I'm quite confident that most of these actors are on HGH and testosterone anyways. 
So just take the needle to the butt and give me some muscles. <laughs> like, let's let's go here. Yeah, but no, David uh, Harbour looks great in this. I, I know he was reluctant to take the role in the first place uh, because he he didn't want to to revisit the movie. It's it's always that question of why why go and do it. I, I know that the uh, the second Hellboy movie wasn't received well. It went off script off the comic book it didn't really follow a specific arc it was a brand new story written by Guillermo del Toro and yeah and it wasn't received well I know they had a third one queued up and they just didn't ke- continue with it so then it was just a matter of hey do you keep going or not I, I understand the, the rebate especially if you're going to go with that darker feel because if, if your goal is to achieve that rated R audience you can't then just pick up where the last one left off well and I think uh, Deadpool did prove that there is a big um, demand for rated R comic movies you know like these movies aren't all you know, for children. The comic books aren't all for children. There's some really brutal stories out there that that deserve film renditions that, that carry that, that forward. I think Del Torrio went more with the fantasy route, you know, and I think a lot of the Hellboy fans and, yeah, they wanted, it, it's about, you know, hell and the devil like you know what i mean like and they went really like uber fantasy especially in two yeah um so so i i do think a reboot is 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 gonna do do it well i i'm 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 excited to give it a shot let's put it like that like i have no expectations of where it's gonna land going in but i am looking forward to seeing you know what they do with this character and how they reboot it you know it looks like it's well done yeah which is all i ask for i i'm hoping they they do it really well i i don't know if they're going i i have actually haven't looked into it very much i don't know if they're going into a full like deep origin story or are they just trying to just pick up and kind of lightly touch the the start um origin story has been played before so i, I i'm hoping they kind of just pick up into some action let everybody just you kind of carry over some of that, those first movies, what we understand about Hellboy and then just pick up from there. Uh, so hopefully it, it's not a slow build and it's a quick, uh, quick hit into the story. Well then after that Friday, when Hellboy releases Sunday's the game of Thrones premiere that everybody has been drooling at the mouth for again, it's coming to a close, you know, they're, they're extending the length of the episodes. They're only doing, what is it, six yeah. uh, six episodes for, for as many years as people have gotten committed to this show. And, and I mean, there's still people that are, are just starting it now, getting ready for laces. So I know at least like four people that You've were been watching you know, now. Yeah, that, that were so anti Game of Thrones because I, I understand that mentality when everybody's talking about something and everybody's telling you to watch something. There's something nearby there that just says, ah, fuck them. I'm not watching this at all. Just to spite, like there's that, there's that, there's that spiteful bone in all of us that every once in a while, when people are telling you, you should do something, you just don't do it just because, and even the, the hype of this last season's even getting those people to be like, all right, I'll, I'll get on the train for this last season. I might as well partake in, in society. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite literally becoming like a cultural event. So, so yeah, you, you could be that person who just entrenches in the fact that you don't want to. To, to, to be a sheep that follows everybody else. But you know, t- sometimes sometimes the sheep just need to be entertained and a good show is a good show and some people just have to get over it. But yeah, like you said, people are, are coming out of the world works. There's, there's so much binge watching. Of, I'd love to see like the HBO Go stats of how many people went from episode one all the way through episode six finale uh, at this point in time and just crushed through the, the series in, a, in the last 30 days. Well, in, in you know, the, the stats of, of production that they're putting out there, you know, over hour long episodes, one episode, one plus hour of just straight battle, straight battle scene. You know what I mean? Like. I, I cannot imagine what it's going to be like to just watch people get their arms and legs chopped off for a full hour straight. Yeah. Dragons flying around all kind of like, like that is going to be an epic episode. It, it's, it's exciting that it's, it's finally coming. We have all been waiting for a long time. You know, there's, there's no books to, to base this off of anymore. So you don't have that literary asshole sitting in the corner like, well, I, I already know what's going to happen. <laughs> You know, like, no, you don't know shit, buddy. We all, we're all in the dark. Let's all hold hands and, and walk through this tunnel together. Like, that, that's that's the part I'm kind of looking forward to, too. Yeah, I, I had to, to watch some some recaps and refreshers because I've, I've got the memory of 
some animal that has no memory. Um, and it's, it's really difficult for me to kind of keep track of all of the different arcs and all the different things. And I, so I watched a bunch of, uh, IGN has a bunch of season one in 10 minutes, season two in 10 minutes. So I crushed through every one of those and I was reminded by a, a lot of, uh, things that my, my brain has selectively forgotten. Oh about. yeah. He's a dick. <laughs> oh yeah. He died. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm prepped. I'm, I'm ready to go waiting for, uh, for the release of that as well. Well, and then the last release of the month that everyone's looking forward to and is another huge cultural event is obviously Avengers end game. I'm at a point now where I'm ready to shut all social media down. I, I don't understand why when movies like this happen, <laughs> The constant leaks. Why would you want to leak anything about this movie? You know, they the Russo brothers came out and said flat out that the stuff in the trailer isn't even in the movie. They're trying to direct people away from this movie so much that the shit in the trailers ain't even in the yeah. movie. It's all B-roll and shit, you know. So I, I just, I want to go in with a with a with just a clean sponge of a brain to soak up this movie. And I, 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 I keep having to turn away from all these articles of like, you know, theorize you know ending to the like like, don't keep it to yourself pal keep it to yourself like and who are the people that want to know about this movie before you go in you know everyone's gonna see a lot of people everyone's going Uh, to see it there's still a lot of people clicking on these things which is why they're they're still driving driving all these little speculative articles i don't understand that mentality at all like why would you want to go into a three-hour movie that that has been so anticipated 10 years of making other movies to build up to this, the way that the infinity war ended and left everything just wide open for it to happen. Like, why do you want to spoil that? And it's not like movies are cheap anymore. It it, it blows my mind. The amount of curiosity, you know, I understand the curiosity show some restraint, show some willpower, you know what I mean? And just say, okay, I can wait another little bit. Like I want to know what they had to do with it. And then once we see what they did with it, then we can all regurgitate, you know, well, I would have done, uh, you know what I would have liked to see. Well, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, for me, it gets even worse after the release. Cause I rarely go see a movie on opening night. That's just not what me and Natalie do. I'm going to end up waiting a couple of days, get a babysitter, go see a, a oh, yeah, it's like two and, weeks of memes. Two and, weeks of memes that you have no fucking clue what they I, mean. And I shut it, <laughs> I have to shut everything down. So normally right before the release of these big movies and things that I want to see, I have to turn off my notifications for like my Google news feed that hits my phone and stuff like that because you know the, the algorithms already know that I'm super interested in these things. So I will just get fed headline after headline. Uh, and some of these headlines are just they're just, they just, they don't give a shit. How many people but, they just yeah. spoiled the movie for? Like, I want to find you and punch you. Whoever wrote this, I want to find you like, and punch yeah, you. You are a dick. Literally in 10 words, I'm going to, I'm going to find out something significant. Like this, that is how I found out that Spider-Man died was the day after my Google feed came up and it was just, it just straight in the headline. It was six words and it just flat out tells me Spider-Man's dead. And I was like, oh my God, I was going to see the movie the next day. And it's like, step one, I've already oh, yeah. ruined on something because somebody just couldn't conceal that into the article because they got to clickbait the hell out of everybody and just put it up there ruin ruin a, a, a experience for me uh so i have to shut everything down so right before the movie goes say through game of thrones if i don't have a chance to watch it on a sunday night i've got i shut everything down all notifications on my phone go off and i just have to to be ready to, to live in the dark age for a day. Same thing happened to me with infinity wars. So, you know, our, our buddy Stu is a huge collector. So he looks at all the toys and all these toy manufacturers don't realize they're, they're fucking up and they're putting shit out there. So he's seen initially that Thor's hammer and a toy had a Groot arm. So he came over one day and I tell him all the time, shut the fuck up. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what you have seen, what you heard. Like, just shut the fuck up. I don't care. And he said flat out, you know, like, yeah, well, Groot, Groot does something with the hammer. I seen it on a toy. And I was like, why, why would you say that? And then in that movie, that's a big scene. Yeah. You know, when the hammer's getting made and Groot grabs it and shatters his arm. And when I was sitting in the theater, I wanted to kill that son of a bitch. I swear to God, when that part came on and I knew it was coming and I knew it was going to happen. That scene would have been so epic if I didn't know that information. And I I just remember sitting in a crowded theater 
on a Thursday night just going, stew, you fucking bastard. <laughs> like, oh, my God, I could fucking kill you right now. It was, it was horrible. You know, so I just – I don't understand the mentality of wanting – you know, you know, when the, the magazines you get, it, say, there's, a, there's a business the behind the spoilers, the business, there's a business yeah. behind it, and I and I get that. There's those asshole friends that just want to share a meme that you don't know, and, or they just want to be the one to. I, I'd like to know the psychological reasonings behind it, you know what I mean? Like, what is that need to tell somebody something they don't know, even though they you know they don't want to know it. Psychological trigger that just be like, oh, have you heard? Have you heard? It's that gossip kind of thing that that you know. I'm sure there's studies on yeah, it. I'm, I'm actually probably gonna do some. I, I'm searching. sure. I'm sure there's a strong dopamine hit just for it's like that innate asshole dopamine hit that everybody's gonna get. You just you just really enjoy ruining somebody's day. It uplifts it uplifts your day somehow. Yeah, it's 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 a highly frustrating thing. Another frustrating thing is I wasn't able to get tickets to the Star Wars celebration that is happening in Chicago. Big national, huge Star Wars convention, the size of C2E2, but only dedicated to Star Wars. And I'm going to do my best to beg, borrow, and steal my way into this goddamn con. Don't, don't so they know I can that, that you are the founder of the Nerd Cantina? I got it. <laughs> you, would think, you would think, you know, C2E2 is gracious enough to, to appreciate my attendance. Star Wars, uh, Disney and Lucas, not so much. Yeah. They This thing sold out in seconds. Like, it is, it is phenomenally huge and unbelievably filled <laughs> at this point. But I have, I have connections. I haven't worked in the nightlife of Chicago for 10 years without meeting a few people that might be able to pull some strings. And I definitely want to be able to get in and I doubt I'll be able to get like any of the kind of the interviews that I got from C2E2. Who knows? You know, you never know yeah. who's who's walking around and might have a few minutes. But even just to go and be able to write an article and talk about it, you know, on the podcast the following week about what they were doing, how was it? But yeah, it's it's going to be epic. And I'm, I'm still a little salty of uh, the Friends of the Parks making uh, the city of Chicago lose the uh, Star Wars Museum. So this is like my little, like, oh, well, I, I could have just came to this museum any day I wanted for the rest of my life, considering they were going to build it in Chicago. But 15 people that really love grass downtown put the kibosh on that real quick. So this is the, uh, I guess, next best thing for, uh, for us local Chicagoans. So I'm really going to try to get in there, try to try to bring some information to our viewers and, and readers from that. Yeah. Speaking of the Star Wars realm, you got the, the latest news of uh, Mark Hamill now playing the, the voice of Chucky. You know, I wasn't going to probably see this Chucky movie. I'm not a big horror fan. I do remember Chucky when I was a kid. But Mark Hamill is a phenomenal voice actor. He was he's he's done probably the best rendition of the Joker voice in all the animated series. Is he has really made himself a a career in the voice acting realm. Like everybody, he'll always be Luke, but he he is able to really manipulate his voice and do a really good job. Has he done um, anything other than Joker though? Uh, so I, I know that he's gr- done a great Joker, and he's he is he is the voice of Joker, and and that's regardless of who plays it in the movie. Everybody's going to hear that cartoon Mark Hamill voice for Joker, but has he done anything else? No, this is where I, the this I hear Stu in the back of my head yelling at me because he could he could ramble off probably five or six other ones because we've had this conversation. I can't pull him off the top of my head right now, but yeah, he's he's done other really notable voice acting roles uh, besides the Joker. So one interesting thing is uh, I came across, there's a Robot Chicken episode where they do, where they have uh, Chucky and Mark Hamill is the voice of Chucky on Robot Chicken. So, so, he so, so he's already, yeah, he's already played a little bit of, uh, if you're on an idea of kind of his jokey side of what he thinks the Chucky voice would be, it would be there. I just don't want Chucky to sound like Joker. Uh, I don't want Chucky to have the Joker laugh or anything like that, right? But assuming that he's going to be able to come up with a new sinister laugh, a new way to just creep the hell out of everybody, then uh, I, I think he's going to kill uh, kill Chucky. And it, it does bring some interest from me into it. Uh, I'm not a horror fan, and and Chucky haunted my dreams as a child. That was uh, that was one that I just had no tolerance for as a kid. But uh, it, it does make me want to see it. I was a little older, so it came off a little cheesy to me. But yeah, you were. You were prying oh, yeah. in for my toys are going to kill me age. Oh, yeah. And 
<laughs> so this one, uh, this one's got a new twist to it too, in the sense that it's not a, uh, it's not the the doll is alive. It is a, uh, it is a robot. So it's a, it's a robotic toy that the AI then comes to life. So, yeah, so yeah, it's they're now, making, yeah, they're making it more of an updated version, which I mean, you, you, you gotta keep up with the times. Well, you know? and, and it is topical in the sense that, you know, you, now you don't have to turn off your brain and think of some kind of magical embodiment of a toy. Now it's like, Oh no! Well, like, we're seriously gonna have robot toys, and it might kill my kids. Well, you, you don't want to <laughs> expose another generation to dirty voodoo. Like I, <laughs> I thought, I thought, I thought everybody knows about knows about voodoo. Yeah, so it's a uh, looks like it could be a, a a watch somewhere down the road. I, I don't know when I'm gonna get to it in my queue. I don't think I'm gonna go see it in the theater or anything, but it, it should be good. One thing that I do really want to watch that everyone's talking about is the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. So when they released Zack Snyder and Justice League came out, you can kind of tell that it was, it had two different directions, you know, like that, that the movie was going one way, people decided to go a different way, and then they took it in a separate direction. So the movie does kind of have like this choppy kind of feel, big ups to DC's horrible filmmaking. Yeah, but do I really want to sit through a four-hour cut of of a movie that I already really didn't care about to go see a direction that it's not going to go and then just kind of forget that it happened just to see what it could have been? But I want to know why they they decided to change directions. Yeah, no, I am curious, you know what I mean? Like, because you you hire a guy, he, he... It's not like they just said, hey, Zach, make us a Justice League movie. They had meetings. They talked, they went over scripts, they went over storyboards, they had a plan with this. What happened in, you know, post shoots that WB execs got that made them say, no, shut this down, hit the stop button, you know, stop the presses, they hit the big red button, brought somebody else in, like, what was it that they didn't like? And I'm not watching it because I think it's going to be better or more entertaining. It is that that natural curiosity that just says what happened here. It was highly publicized. They had to CG out, CGI out a Henry Cable mustache for for reshoots. Like it just, it it just snowballed a bunch of bullshit with that movie. And you, you wonder if the final cut of justice league was worse because of it. If it was better because of it, you know, I, I'd like to know like, oh, yeah, that's that ship was sinking and they did the right thing and tried to save it still is a bad movie, but at least they tried to save it. Or is Zack Snyder's rendition a little bit better and they, they just didn't understand what he was trying to do or, you know, I'm that that's really what it is. I think a lot of fans are just really curious is the, the process these studios go through. And, and that that's the only real curiosity I have to it uh, i do appreciate kind of different directions that movies can go and, and understanding and i think it does give you a little bit of insight as far as how drastic one vision can be from the other what really a director his effect on a sh- on an episode or on a movie or whatever you're, you're looking at really how much impact they have on the the end product the artistic representation of, of what they're trying to tell did you see the the actual like clip or the the interview where he talked about this at Snyder, no, Snyder I, Con. You got to go look at this because now, uh, so I went and watched this. And they Snyder, denied that this thing even existed for, you know, two years. They denied that this, this cut even oh, existed. Yeah. Well, this, this Snyder Con just made me laugh that I wanted to talk about it in the sense that it was, it really just looked like a, a weird room of like 60 people that I guess were just watching Snyder cut releases of his past movies. And I'm just really thinking that it's, it's seriously just them in a, in a dingy room, bunch of a bunch of nerds paying a whole lot of money to sit and just watch movies with Snyder while he's just really stroking himself to some degree in this Snyder con, and then having this Q and A afterwards, and that's where he's talking about crush moment. Yeah, it, 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 it really, it really said it seemed uh, like it, it might have been a, a bit of a masturbatory act of uh, of nerd culture there, but. You've got to watch a really like grainy video where he's uh, he's largely just saying like you know get get over yourself get get over the the fact that superheroes don't don't commit murder and aren't doing violence like he yeah. he's really got that darker yeah. direction and that might be what it really in the end turned off DC is that it, it they just didn't want to take it. You made um, Batman kill people like yeah you made Batman kill people yeah, and, and Batman don't kill people and Superman kills somebody like yeah like these are like these are big things like. Like they go against what these these people stand for and what like the 
the main morals of these comics were about, you know, and he just was like, you know, it's, it's the same kind of thing that I have a problem with rain uh, in star Wars is that you're taking my GI Joes and playing He-Man with them. Like that's not, it's not how you do it, buddy. You could, you could take these toys and, and use your imagination and do, do what you want to do. But in kind of a rail system, you know what I mean? Like you have to honor what, fans expectations kind of are what what the history of you know 70 80 years of batman to to go off of yeah you know what i mean in 80 years he don't kill nobody and and now you just want to be the one be like yeah no fuck that batman kills people like my batman kills people well okay well we don't want your batman (laughs) you know like and it's it's fair to say that yeah well and it goes completely against like you know batman the character in itself is he's he is trying not to get sucked into the darkness of Gotham. He's trying not to be the the bad guy, right? And and now you just make it to where he's he's completely okay with it that he's got this you know utilitarian approach towards I, I can kill anybody else as long as it's further than greater good. Well, no, that's that's actually not his identity. His identity is that he he refuses to do these things because he doesn't want to get pulled into the darkness. Well, I remember I remember uh, being in Man of Steel and and watching Superman snap Zod's neck and just wanting to stand up and be like, oh hell no, <laughs> like like oh no, like this is some bullshit, you know, like and there's a lot of people that felt that way, like you can't, you just can't do certain things, you know what I mean? You just can't do it and not expect huge repercussions, you know, from 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 these things like huge fallout like you you just can't do it yeah like i'm sorry speaking of fallout um do you read the jordan peele comment story yeah and i knew you were gonna go here which we're we're in dangerous territory two white guys talking about a a a director who says he won't cast white leads i agree with them i'm fine with i'm fine with him saying that like he is he's he is absolutely right we've all seen that movie you know what i mean I didn't give us a great review. I didn't give it a bad review. But the one thing I said in it is he commanded some great acting performances from it. You know, all the, all the African-American leads were phenomenal in the movie. I have no problem yeah, I, with going in more movies with more more minority leads whatsoever. Yeah, I, I'm indifferent towards the, the comments. One, you, what you never see, right, all these articles that are talking about what he said – None of them are addressing what he was asked, right, or or, or what really drove that conversation. There, there's no context there. You know, he might have been 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 pushed into a corner that he had to make that statement, right? And if he didn't have to make that statement, I just wish he wouldn't, right? I'm good if he continues to never hire a white lead and and the stories he's trying to tell and the the, the people that he's trying to to direct uh, remain in African Americans, right? I have no issue with that. I, I hope he just didn't unprovoked come and just make the statement because it it just then at that point in time, it's, it's a why, why do it? What I envision is that really somebody kind of backed him into a corner was like, Hey, Hey, you got, you got two big, big movies now, right? There's there's only, only, only black leads here. When are you going to, you know, get a, get a white one in there. And then he was kind of forced into either lying to everybody. That's that's exactly how I imagine. Right. And then he's forced into either lying to everybody and saying, Oh, well, I'm I'm working on one or we'll, we'll we'll get there. Uh, Or, Tell the truth, right? And I'm good with the truth. I'm always good with the truth. My my only problem is is so say you have a a big director with a couple of successful movies and they ask him when he's gonna put a minority lead in, and he gives like an honest answer, somewhat of a well, being a white male, I truly don't understand the life that minorities lead and I don't feel comfortable directing a a situation that I don't understand. So me being a white male, I don't know the struggles of a black man. So I find it hard to direct a lead black role in a way that honors the yeah, black community. It's easy to make a cultural misstep when you don't understand the culture. Like, stay away from it. So, but but you get a white director that has gives an honest answer like that. He's getting roasted. He's getting roasted. And and that's that's really my only problem is that we've come to a point in society where we context doesn't matter. Like you you stated, you know what they just took the the line and put out the the headline because they knew it would get clicks. It, they knew it would get guys like us talking about it. And two, it's it's very selective. You know what I mean? If a white guy a director just said I don't want to direct black people, no, you should be roasted. It's, you know hone your craft. Yeah. But it is understandable for, for a white director to say, you know, 
I'm not going to be the director of the next Boys in the Hood because I don't know that life. And I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable directing that movie. I wouldn't feel comfortable directing that those roles because I don't understand that. And that should be okay too, you know? And, and I think that, you know, most people in the minority community would actually kind of like appreciate that. Now we're, what, what falls is, is that movie studios, instead of finding a minority director to direct that role, they would just recast it as a white person. There's a lot of other things that, that come into that, that can make that situation worse. But we're just talking about the, the answer to the question right now. And I just feel that there's, it's a, it's a, you know, there's two sides of that coin and only one side is polished and the other side gets you, gets you run out of town. And I think that's kind of like a, a messed up situation that, that they kind of put out there. I don't think what he said is, is inappropriate. And I, and, I, and I can think, and I can see him one day, just one, as he furthers in his directing career or whatever else, wanting to tell different stories, more, more inclusive stories and, and changing his mind. And he's got the room to do that too, right? He's got the somewhere down the road. If he ever decides uh, to go with a different story that has a white lead, he's, I'm sure he's going to get roasted for that. Yeah, who knows what, his brain, what kind yeah. of stories his brain is going to come up with later on in life, 10 years from now where he, he does find a, a, a role that he wants to cast a, a white lead in, you know, but if he never does more power yeah. to him, you know, he's, he's making good movies. And, it, and to be perfectly honest, I enjoy seeing more variety in my movies. Like I said, that the acting in, in us was, was phenomenal. I thought, you know, it was, it was great. I didn't appreciate the story. Yeah. You know, so, so that was my only, you know, negative point of it. I think the ending was kind of anticlimactic as far, as far as the performances he was able to get from a majority minority class uh, of, of actors. I thought, I thought that was phenomenal. And if he keeps putting that kind of quality who cares what color the, the roles are? You know what I mean? Just keep putting out good content. That's all we care about. Yeah. Well, I think uh, at this point in time, we really need to start getting into some of these interviews before this show ends up making it to the three hour mark before we get into our Snyder cut realm of, uh, yeah, of we're, not trying to do a, a Rogan, we're not trying to do a Rogan yeah. length podcast. Yeah. So uh, first interview that we have is going to be today with Erica Fett, renowned cosplayer, sweetheart of a person. But I know you uh, recently posted your article on the C2E2 cosplay uh, as you got some snaps of uh and some pictures of individuals out there you want to talk about your your article yeah we um i had to do a lot of interviews so the cons big every they're all in different locations you know as i was scheduling them so i did i was doing a lot of walking through the floor so i really didn't have time to go to the costume contest i didn't have time to just hang out at the entrance where everybody is just posing for pictures because Right before you walk into con, some of the major costumes, they just stand out in front and they just let people walk up and take pictures because some of these some of these guys are on stilts. Some of them have costumes that aren't really movable, you know, so for them to walk through some of these smaller hallways at the con is really difficult for them. So they post up in the front. Next year, you're going to have um, to request 10 press passes, let them knock you down to four, and then at least you can get a couple more people wandering around. No, next year, next year, I plan on going with a, a small team. Like that's, that's for sure. I was, I was nervous asking for the one you know, on this one. So I, I wasn't trying to push my luck next year. Next year, we're going to come with a, a, a better game plan for it. But I did want to feature some of the, some of the good ones that I was able to see, you know, and I had my cell phone on me at all times. So if, if I was walking into an interview, it'd be nothing for me to just Hey, can I take a picture of you real quick? I'd take a picture of them. I'd write down their Instagram handle because I wanted to make sure they got noticed because a lot of them, you know, if you, if you read the article, all the Instagram handles are, you know, such and such cosplay, such and such cosplay. So they're, they're trying to promote their craft. They're trying to promote what they do. So I wanted to make, at least give them a, a, a medium to, to, to show that off too. So I think I was able to get like a dozen on there. And, you know, the, one of the, the big gets, though, was Erica. You know, she's really big in the cosplay community. You know, she's, she's, she's just a big name when it comes to, to nerds in general, you know. Um, yeah, which for, for me, I, I really, I'm not a convention guy and don't pay attention much to the cosplay world. So when you told me that, hey, you're going to interview Erica Fett the next day, one of the first things I did, because I was trying to help you do some interview prep along the way, was multitasking while at work, took a, took a little break and punched into to the good old Google Erica Fett. And the images that I just got, got punched in the face with at work were, uh, it was, there was a lot of breasts. There were, <laughs> yeah. there were, there were a lot of breasts and 
definitely not safe for work search. Uh, should, made me immediately feel uncomfortable. I had to turn that down, go to, I don't know, like an incognito browser on my phone and, and hide for a minute in order to, to, to help you there. So for those of you who want to find her, just, just I say know your surroundings uh, if you, uh, you really want to go ahead and, and do a search. I, I suggest you do a search. One, she's a brilliant cosplayer and gorgeous. Uh, so go ahead and do the search. Maybe while you're listening to the interview, put a face to the, to the actual audio of, of what a sweetheart person she is. Uh, but, but yeah, definitely know your surroundings, clear your web history, maybe, I don't know, incognito browser. Depends on what kind of relationship you have with your girlfriend or, or spouse. You might want to conceal that from her too. Uh, but it's a, it's a definitely a uh, not safe for work cosplayer for sure. Yeah, I, I, I went through a similar scenario once I, I had told, you know, my girlfriend that, uh, I got the interview, you know, I was like, look, I got this interview with Erica Fetch. She's a huge cosplayer and she does boudoir pictures. You know, I wasn't, wasn't hiding the fact, you know, I knew that if she was going to eventually Google who she was and stuff like that. But yeah, I got like two days later after the interview, uh, the text message with picture of like a bunch of her Instagram pictures that just was like, Oh, way to downplay this one, buddy. Like, I was like, what, <laughs> you know, like, like, what do you, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, you didn't, you didn't mention, you know, that, that she was taking these kind of pics, which as a, as a person who, who has no problem with, with women that, that choose to, to do racy photos or anything like that. I'm actually really proud. We live in a day and age where they don't have to just submit these kinds of pictures to like a playboy yeah. and let, and let, let, you know, Hugh Hefner rake in all this money, give these women peanuts of, of the profit, you know, that, that women that are comfortable in themselves, comfortable in their body and want to put these pictures out into the world now get to rake in the majority of the profits can build a, a good following and a life off this. You know, if, if that's your alley, drive up it, man. I, I, I wish you the best of luck, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, where's, where's she at it with the, like Instagram followers, is she two plus million? Two yeah, million. like two and a yeah, half million, million Instagram followers. So, I mean, she she has a she's you know that 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 new age term of influencer. She's she's definitely an an influencer. Uh, which was which was reason why it was a big get for us. You know, there's she's got a big calling. You know, and and a lot of people want to to get close to her to just do interviews and, and, and write articles on and use that kind of fame that she has uh, to, to boost their brand. Um, so for her to, to recognize what we're doing over at the cantina and really try to, to help us out and, and do us a solid by giving us that quick interview and just being overall, you know, great person. I'm glad that we get to promote a side of her that, that you don't see on Instagram, you know, bring some facts out there, show, show the world her personality. Yes. Let's go ahead and, uh, and show the world her personality and we'll play uh, our interview with Eric. All right. Uh, welcome to the show. I'm here with uh, the famous cosplayer, Eric Fett. Thank you very much for taking some time out of your schedule to, to squeeze us in for this interview. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'd like to start off with just a little bit about your background, you know, where you're from, you know, uh, your schooling or anything like that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have a master's degree and while I was getting my master's degree, I kind of started dabbling in a little bit of like boudoir photography and modeling. And from there, it just kind of evolved into taking kind of like my nerdy interest into cosplay and I model for Suicide Girls and other sites like Zivity, Um and it just kind of spiraled from there and then it just kind of turned into this whole huge modeling venture and here I am. <laughs> now have you always had uh, the nerd bone in you for, for as long as you can remember? Oh Is yeah. Is something you've always had Oh yeah. In? Like I, I remember growing up and watching Toonami on Adult Swim and you know that was when like Reboot was big and then Dragon Ball Z Sailor Moon and then Batman the animated series so I was like huge on Batman all of my life and so really growing up with all of those great like Sunday morning cartoons and Toonami I just kind of like really fell in love with kind of like the nerddom um, and then I it's just kind of evolved for me into just being my life now. <laughs> so how long have you say could you say you've been cosplaying actually? Um, well I would say I, I started in probably like 2011 um, I think the first time I really dabbled in it, I did a set for Suicide Girls. So it was a Poison Ivy set. And uh, from there, it just kind of went from me going to conventions like San Diego Comic Con, New York Comic Con, and I would just randomly cosplay. And at the time, I didn't realize it was like this entire community of, you know, cosplayers. And I was just like, I might dress them up. 
and now it's just t- totally turned into like, this huge venture and I'm like do you amazing. enjoy uh, making your own costumes do you purchase a lot of them or? so it's about uh, well you know I've made a lot of them so I like to sew and I like to craft like warbla and foam and stuff like that but with my time constraints lately, it's a little harder to, you know, devote times for big builds. So I find myself kind of like infusing a little bit. If I can buy a majority of it online and then kind of like if I need to sew or add anything in. Yeah, it's, it's super easy that way. How long after you started cosplaying did you, would you say it technically became a job for you? Ooh. Well, honestly, like even up until a couple years ago, I was working a normal full-time job, you know, a nine to five job. And, you know, the thing for me was it was hard because I had, the, you know, my master's degree. And so I really wanted to pursue, you know, my master's degree work of like humanitarian work in law. Uh, but then I was finding that, you know, having a normal job, I couldn't take off for cons or I would have, you know, time constraints where I couldn't take off of work. You so, have to make that choice of yeah. which fork in the road you took. And so, down. you know, uh, Patreon, the site came around for a lot of creators and it, it kind of opened up an ability in a way for us to make money off of our own craft. And so I remember just the one day I was like, I think I'm going to quit my job. And it was a really scary thing, but you know, I, I did and I never looked back and it was, it's been amazing because I get to come to conventions like this and meet amazing people like you. Oh, and you great. know, it's amazing. I it's really fun. really appreciate it. Yeah. As most of your fans would know, you obviously love tattoos yes. uh, <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. How often would you say you, you tend to go to the tattoo shop and, and express yourself oh, that way? Oh my word. Um, well, like the big thing lately is now I'm like, you know, I started getting tattooed when I was 18. so. You know, when, when you're 18, you know, your interests are a little bit different. So I found myself covering up a couple of my older, um, you know, some of my older work. And, you know, now tattoos have completely evolved. And now it's like there's insane, amazing artists out there that are just so detailed and it's amazing. So I would say, oh, gosh, maybe every like two months, I would say, is when I get tattooed. Do you find that you enjoy expressing your nerd culture in that kind of form? I know you oh, have yeah. a lot of oh, yeah. nerd-oriented I, tattoos. I feel like almost everything on my, my arm. <laughs> yeah, 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 see, yeah. I feel like it, when, you, when you're in love with something, like, when you have it on you, it's your story. And that's why I love tattoos, because, like, to me, my tattoos are my story. So, like, it's everything that I've grown up with, like, with... Dharma Initiative from Lost because I was obsessed with Lost and like Skeletor and mum Ra, you know, all the, the cartoons I grew up with, all the bad guys, I was like, oh, they're so badass, you know. I do. I always find myself wanting more tattoos of like nerdy things. Yeah, like I always found that I love wearing a good nerd shirt and yes, tattoos are yes. just that kind of like permanent nerd shirt Absolutely. that you get to wear every day. Absolutely. And with the rise of, of nerd culture, do you find that your success is somewhat tied to like your authenticity, the fact that you have a lot of the nerd culture tattoos and yeah i think that it's, it's something that like i've grown up with it so it's something that i can easily identify with people and i feel like when it comes to tattoos like when I, it, it makes me so happy when someone's like oh my god your tattoo thank you shoe and i'm like yes you know and it's just one of those things you can identify with and connect with people well, with the rise of pop culture and everything you find a lot of people that were just in the boudoir form started taking on a lot of the oh, yes. pop culture nerd stuff, Absolutely. but they weren't really authentic right. nerds. Um, you have a very loyal fan base. Do you do you find that because you are so authentic, it, it really draws in that that loyal crowd that that supports you and, and lets what? you be able to do these things? I sure hope so. Like the way I see it, I grew up like one of those nerd the girls that like guys didn't want to talk to. And so I feel like I always express myself through video games. And so like growing up, like I played all video games like all of my life. And so that was a big thing for me because I was like, oh, all my best friends play video games. I'm playing video games. Halo came out. Oh my gosh. And so like for me, it's just one of those things where that's just who I am. That's how I grew up. But I hope that people like that about me. I don't know. <laughs> I try to just be I'm me. Sure they I'm do. silly. I'm sure they do. Like the thing is about me is I'm just a silly person. I, I like make an ass of myself every single day. And I just like to have fun and smile you and have, have a good time. Yeah, exactly. Really oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> so with uh, with your busy schedule, all the cons and the cosplay, wear and tear, do you ever feel you get a little burnt out, uh, you know, with, with the, the hectic schedule? The only thing that I really get burnt out on is I miss my dogs when I travel, like my animals. That's the only sad thing is I'm always constantly checking my furbo because I miss my animals so much. But honestly, like, I live for travel. Like, I love to experience new things, like, as far as food, cities, people. And honestly, coming to conventions where I get to meet people, it's, it's one of my favorite things because I get to put a face to, like, you know, the, the person who's been contacting me on Twitter or Instagram, you know. So for me, I love coming to these things because I like, I like the energy at conventions. So as far as burnout... I mean, I'd be 
the end of the day, I just go to bed at like nine. <laughs> you know, I'm just an old lady. That's I was going to add that was my next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what, do you, what do you tend to do when you feel that Ooh. that burn coming on? Do you just deep dive deep into some anime or do, well, you, do you like to I'm a workaholic. And like, the thing is, is I love what I do. Like I live, I live and breathe all of this. Like this is constantly something that I'm always doing. Um, most of the time I just binge stuff though. Like if I need to binge, it's always like the X-Files or... Uh, the Umbrella Academy on Netflix, which is amazing. Yeah, we just oh my on that a couple weeks ago. Oh, it was really good. So good. good. Um, so that's a good thing is like too when you're you know when I'm working or answering emails or scheduling out posts on you know, social media, it's always good because I can like decompress and like binge TV while I'm doing everything. So it's it's like a win win. You know, I kind of I have the best job in the world. I really do. <laughs> and and how how do you narrow down your selection from all the different genres? You you said you like video games, yes. you like anime, yeah. you like you know you like so it's, many things. Yes. How do you condense? Oh you, you only have two days, so you get two costumes. <laughs> How do you how do you well, look in that suitcase and say this is the one today? I will tell you. You know, I used to go for like the crazy big builds where I was like, yes, I'm going to do this crazy Skeletor build and this crazy armor. And then I was like, oh man, I'm not comfortable. So for me now, a big thing of, of what I choose to wear at a convention Wearability. is yeah, com- yeah, I want to be comfortable because I'm in it all day. And I just want to be comfortable at the end of the day because you want to enjoy these things too. You know, yeah, pictures are great, but. I love the conventions as a, as a fan myself, so I want to be comfy too. How many uh, cons on a average would you say you do a year? Ooh. Some years it's like seven. Uh, this year so far I've done I think three, and then I've got Anime Inc. coming up in Virginia, I believe, in June, and then I've got New York coming up. And those are the only two right now that are solidly booked, but I might have a couple more that slide in there. So. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, no. Maybe, I would say on average maybe seven to eight or nine. How did you get associated with uh, C4 Magazine? Well, my the photographer I usually use for my cosplay, he's in Columbus, Ohio, and his name's Wes Smith. He goes by The Portrait Dude. He's fantastic, and he's been friends with Alan, who is the owner of C4 Magazine, for a long time. And they were starting the Kickstarter, and then Wes came to me and asked me to be a part of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for even thinking of me and considering me. Um, and so they just, he introduced me to Alan and we just instantly hit it off and it was awesome. <laughs> oh, that's great. And uh, just to, to kind of give a wrap up, like, what is uh, your current interest right now? Like, what are you really like looking forward to going home and diving back into when you get off that plane? Ooh, well, let's see. I'm trying to think. I need to finish Saga. Saga a by, great oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, I've only heard uh, the beginnings, but oh I, my need, gosh. I need to I'm like, it. I'm in like the sixth book right now, and my, my best friend, Louis Starda, she got me, she got it for me for Christmas. She's like, you will love this, and I am so addicted to it. So I've got to read that, and then. So when are you coming here with the horns on? And it, oh, I know, I know, I know, Atlanta. I know, oh my God. <laughs> There's so, I know, I want to be, um, oh my gosh, the spider, uh, the. Oh my god, what is her name? It's not the Will. I want him to cosplay the Will, but I want to be, oh my gosh, what is her name? It's the spider lady, and I cannot think I, of it. Yeah, I'm, I draw blanks on names. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I was a bouncer in a nightclub for 10 oh years. My god. I would hear a thousand names a weekend. They just go in one ear out the other, oh, now I'm out of habit. It's so horrible. That's what I want to cosplay. Well, I want to cosplay the, the spider lady, and I know as soon as you walk away, I'm going to think of the name. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> but. I mean, that's the thing, too, is it's when I watch these shows, like even the Umbrella Academy, they have such good concept for cosplay. So I watch these things, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I've seen a few uh, Umbrella Academy oh, cosplays class, here today class. that were actually really good. Oh, Just so good. to wrap up so I'm not taking too much of your time, uh, where can our listeners find you at? I know you have Twitter, Patreon, yeah. so if you want to so give us So you can those. find me on Twitter at Erica Fett. On Instagram, it's Erica.Fett. Facebook, it's official I know there's Erica a lot Fett. of clone accounts that we have to Yes, there are a lot of clone down. accounts. Just basically, if it has a lot of followers and is Erica Fett, it's probably me. But ericafett.com is the easiest way to find me. That has all of my social media links. It has all of my information as far as, like, my portfolio and all that good stuff. So, Erica, I'll just say, the hub is ericafett.com. <laughs> As you heard it here first. Google Google Erica Fett. Erica follow, Fett. follow the links. Well, if you Google it, it might be a good time. But... <laughs> 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 well, we really appreciate you taking out your Thank time. Thank you so schedule. much for this having me. It's a pleasure for us. <laughs> and I know as soon as we end this, I'm going to think of the name of her. <laughs> All right, that was the interview with Erica Fett. Steve, again, sweetheart of a person. Uh, and I know you had a, a good long chat with her. I was really uh, happy to, to be able to get that. Um, one, I had to thank uh, Alan Schulting from C4 Magazine for, for bringing her out there because uh, she was working the C4 Magazine booth. She didn't have like a booth of her own to promote her own work. She was there promoting her calendar, 
uh, that you can buy off, off her site, um, which we'll have in the show notes. But it was, it was Alan who, who brought her out to help promote his uh, C4 magazine, which features a lot of cosplayers and convention stuff and things like that. So big thanks to C4 uh, for, for doing that. They're currently in a, a Kickstarter mode to promote their magazine. So, and it just shows you kind of like where Erica's mindset is, is she's not really, you know, she's about the nerd community. That's why I really wanted to interview her and put her out there is she's not just some sexy woman throwing on a slave Leia costume, trying to get likes and follows, you know, she, she cares about the nerd community. She cares about how it's represented. That's why she did an interview with us. And that's why she was at the C4 magazines booth trying to promote this, this uh, quarterly magazine that these guys are doing that is that really promotes the, the lifestyle that she leads. Yeah, and even just uh, to her you know, retweeting and, and sharing what you've done on, uh, on Twitter, it just shows that, again, she's, she's just here to, to promote content, promote the culture, be a part of the culture. Just genuinely, you know, there's no real benefit for her to, to share these things, and there's no real expectation or ask from her to, to help us. She's just using her status as an influencer. Uh, her audience to just further the nerd culture uh, going forward. Which is, which is why I want to make sure that, you know, our audience has all the links to her site. And, and I suggest everybody goes to check out her Patreon, check out her uh, Twitch. If you like, if you like watching people game, she has, she's on Twitch. She does a lot of gaming. Um, And the same thing with uh, C4 magazine. They were, he was a really nice guy. You know what I mean? He could have shut down that interview and said, look, buddy, I didn't pay all this money to fly Eric out here so she could do an interview with, with you. Okay. But no, he wasn't like that. He, he was totally receptive of it. So I wanted to, to give him a chance to promote his magazine and his Kickstarter. So I did a short interview with him also to bring our listeners what, what they're going to be provi- uh, providing in their uh, content. Okay. Well, uh, here's that interview. Hey folks, I'm here with Alan Schulting, the editor and creator of C4 Magazine, a, a cosplay magazine. Uh, thank you for taking some time out of your yeah, day today. Yeah, for sure. And I just want to touch base with you. You uh, were able to provide us with a, a good medium to connect with Erica Fett for our previous interview. So we really appreciate you uh, oh, yeah. taking the time to, to fly her out here and yeah, be a no part problem. of your Erica's great. So what would you like to tell our listeners about uh, your magazine, what you're trying to accomplish? Uh, C4 Magazine. So C4 is, is four parts. It stands for Conventions, Cosplay, Collectibles, and Culture. Okay. So, I have been the editor-at-large for Cosplay Culture magazine for four years. It recently, the company that was publishing it recently got bought out, and they ended production with that title. So, we thought, let's go ahead and bring something back. But this time, instead of having the magazine run by a company, let's run it by fans. You know, let's, let's... Let's get people that understand it because they're part of it. So, you know, our art director, she is a cosplayer herself. You know, myself, I've been collecting comics and doing this industry for over a decade now, you know. And, yeah. You know, our publishers, they collect toys. So it's every everybody that's a part of this group knows this culture. They know this community. They know what's important and what people are really looking for in a magazine. Now, do you have a digital medium alongside with the, uh, the the literary form, or is it just strictly the magazine itself? That's all going to depend on the Kickstarter. Okay. So we launched our Kickstarter yesterday, March 22nd. Was that the day yesterday? Yeah, I think that was the day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it'll be up for a month, so we're already 50% funded, so that's exciting. Yeah, depending on, the, on what we get from the Kickstarter... We'll kind of depend what we do moving forward. We're going to start as a quarterly magazine. That's the plan. Um, we would like to have a digital aspect to that as well. We're going to have a website up that sort of follows conventions we're at, post some of the articles we do, but also offers some different content. Um, so, yeah, we, we have a lot of things planned, and as long as we can fund them, then we're going to do them. You said the magazine's going to be broken into four parts. What kind of... Uh content are you looking to to push for for kind of each section like cosplay tips are you just trying to feature cosplayers um as far as collectibles are you looking for you know unique you know handmade stuff are you trying to feature more independent artists are you trying to push what's what's currently popular in in the the trends i know it's an easy answer but all the above (laughs) uh you know we will we'll gear it towards what our you know our fans want our readers want we'll uh we'll start with what we think they want 
And then as we get feedback from them, like, hey, you know, we'd like to see more of this. All right, well, let's see if we can put that So is that the idea of being uh, quarterly so that with each issue you can get feedback and kind of pivot in the direction that you need to to yeah. cater your fans? Yeah, it's, you know, conventions are kind of weird in, in themselves as in you have almost seasons in conventions like you have in, you know, in nature. Yes. You know, you've got your conventions where people have been working on the costumes all winter, and then Katsukon comes around, and they want to get out there to Katsukon, and here's what I did all summer here, all winter, you know, and then you work on it all summer, and San Diego's here, look what I did. So, you know, we're going to try to base our production schedule around that, around the con season. But also, you know, as part of, like, the culture aspect in the magazine, we also want to try to cover, like, some music festivals. So, you know, that's something that, you know, music has been integrated into this realm of entertainment for so long. And, it, you know, when we had cosplay culture, really any sort of entertainment magazine, blending the comic book stuff and the music stuff together hasn't really been done yet. Well, and if you look at a lot of the festival outfits, they border cosplay. They don't really right. have a character in mind. But you ain't wearing that to your job tomorrow. Right. <laughs> like, right. that's, that's what we know. Yeah, you, well, I mean, you got character. I mean, and it mixes so well. You know, you got people like Slipknot, who they dress in costumes. And, and they kind of, yeah, they pioneered that, that right. kind of thing. You know, you've got, there's so many theatric. I mean, in cosplay culture, we once covered Guar, you know, and all their stage presence. So, I mean, there's. there's and you have presence. DJs like Marshmallow nowadays. Right. You got Marshmallow. And things like that. You know, used to see dead mouse cosplayers everywhere. Oh, I've seen two <laughs> marshmallows and about three dead dead mouses well, here. Yeah, today. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when does the Kickstarter wrap up? Kickstarter's thirty days long, so that'll be towards the end of April, I guess. I don't know how many days are in March. Okay, and <laughs> um, they can just find you at Kickstarter slash C Four Magazine. C Four Mag. Yep, okay. that's what. Uh, or you can just type C Four Magazine in the search. It'll come up there. We're on Facebook, Vero. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, we're on all that at C4Mag. All right. Well, I appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time. Absolutely. And, uh, look forward to promoting your magazine, and I wish you all the success. Thank you very much. Appreciate no, it. Thank you. All right. So, like you said, so C4 Magazine in the interview, he talks about his Kickstarter campaign. I suggest that everybody go over there. We'll have the Kickstarter campaign in the show notes. I'm currently a, a, a backer of his magazine. I like creators in this world and people who, who go out and, and do something. And it's, it's going to take a lot, right? He's still trying to to have a quarterly magazine in a kind of weird digital age, but it, there's, there's still a place for it. There's still things I, I'm a fan of really what he's trying to do. Not really just focusing on one aspect, but nerd culture as a whole, a lot of what we're doing here, there's some similarity there. Uh, and his Kickstarter campaign, the last I checked is it's not fully funded. It's about 60% of the way and it's an all or nothing campaign. So for those of you who don't know Kickstarter, if he doesn't get all that money, the money that was raised gets returned to the people and he gets nothing out of the deal. So get out and support. It's going to be active still uh, until uh, I think it's April 20th or 20th, April. 22nd. So some, somewhere uh, towards the, the back end of April. But uh, get out and support. Uh, if you like Eric, Erica Fett, the, most of the Kickstarter levels that he uh, that they're promoting uh, from $10 and up has some level of Erica Fett swag in the form of uh, unique prints as, as well as uh, some other access that the C4 are offering. Well, that wraps up what we got going with C4 again. Uh, find it all in the show notes. But I know a big find for you at, at C2E2 because you're a, a, a natural fan uh, of her art was uh, Chrissy Zulo. Yeah, I, I love Chrissy Zulo's work. Um, me having two daughters that love nerd culture, I don't want to put all the art in their room that is very realistic and very, you know, kind of male driven. I tend to, in my daughter's room, put up pictures of, you know, powerful women drawn by women. Um, I want to, you know, inspire them that, that women do great things and, and, you know, not follow into the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Chrissy's work is just really, it's really elegant you know, in classy. She has a unique style to where you can tell it's feminine, but it doesn't come off as, I want to say, girly, if that makes any sense. It's, you know, they're, they're strong poses still. They're, they're really well done pieces that invoke a softer side of, of the content, but not so soft that it it feels like it's made for a girl. Like mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have pieces of Chrissy in my own art collection 
that Chrissy did. Uh, and it goes well with all my Brooks stuff and McGinnis stuff. But uh, at the same time, it's in Layla's room with, you know, all her other art that that just kind of has that girl power feel. And it, it fits well in both realms. She she works really hard. She's a, she's a sweetheart of a girl. Um, so I was really happy to be able to to get some time with her. She's really busy too. Yeah, the her her art is is unique. Like you said, it, it kind of plays in that middle ground uh, of animated type drawing in the sense of it's not it's not Disney princess. It's not you know real real big cheeks and and makeup and a couple. It's it's more of that chiseled action packed comic level uh, powerful feel of her art, but still feminine. Still has the the aspects and the tones of uh you know these the art that she does of of disney princesses and uh you know different star wars characters and, and uh that art is it's it's different yeah and she spreads the gamma content you know um just from chrissy in layla's room she has a wonder woman she has a ray from star wars she has a little mermaid she has uh you know i have a fifth element that she drew of uh, uh, Legends of Zelda portrait that she drew. So she's not really just focused on, you know, DC Marvel, you know, she, she does anime, she does, you know, whatever is influencing her and in, in her life, she just draws it, you know, so it's, you can find a wide selection and, and I just, yeah, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of the art. I love what she's doing. Um, I I was able to sneak an interview right at 10 in the morning. So I like, I was literally at the line waiting to get into the con and as soon as the con got in i'm i'm power walking to the back of the to the back of the convention before anybody gets in line to to get some autographs and you know so i was i got there at like 1001 sat down interview is done by like 1015 so she can get on with her day so i was just really happy that she was able to she said you know if you're here at 10 in the morning on saturday she's like i'll sit and talk to you but after that i'm gonna be really busy uh she was so busy that even at c2e2 she wasn't taking commissions that's a big money maker for artists, you know, but she's so busy on commissions through the mail and, and, and her email and stuff like that, that she just doesn't have time for it, you know? So bless your soul. Yeah. And that commission works. That's tough work to, to jam it into these conventions. And the, I mean, you've taken probably a piece that takes two weeks to do and you're condensing it down to, you know, a, a convention, a couple, a couple hours because yeah, you're, you're doing multiple. Yeah. So I, I respect the fact that she, she's not compromising us in what, the, the products she's trying to put out and just trying to engage with her audience instead of having her face down, drawing the whole convention. But let's go ahead and, uh, and, and kick it to the interview now. Here you are with uh, Chrissy Zulo. All right, welcome. I'm here with Chrissy Zulo at C2E2. Um, thanks okay. for having a few minutes yeah. with us before the day gets really busy. Yeah, thank you for having really me. We appreciate yeah, you coming. Of course. <laughs> uh, I'm a big personal fan. That's why oh. I was really uh, happy to get this interview with you this morning. I, I'm really looking forward to letting our listeners know about your work. <laughs> You're um, so sweet. <laughs> so to start, uh, why don't you give everybody just a quick bio of uh, how you got started, uh, your schooling, things like that? Yeah, uh, so I've, I've been drawing my whole life. Uh, I did go to art school at UNC Charlotte, and I did a focus on illustration. And I got really into comic books and comic art, and I basically built up my portfolio during art school, like, geared towards comic book covers. Um, and then I went, I took that portfolio, went to San Diego Comic-Con, and DC at that time was doing, like, a DC talent search type thing, where they were doing portfolio reviews, and every day they would pick... 10 people to meet with editors and I remember on like the very last day I submitted my portfolio and I was one of the 10 people picked and um, I met the Vertigo editor Shelly Bonds uh, that weekend and that was like my first like critique from a, from a real publisher. And that was your first con where you actually brought a portfolio? Yeah, yeah, really? yeah. Wow. so I was super fortunate, super lucky, like right out of school to get to meet with an editor at, at DC Comics, you know, and basically she gave me her card and I held on to that card and all the critiques she told me like, hey, you should work on this, you should work on that. I went home, I did all that stuff and uh, I would just kind of email her and try to get any more feedback from her and it just so happened that the Cinderella, they were doing a book for Cinderella Fables and they needed a cover artist. So it was just like right place, right time kind of thing. And that's how I got well, my I think it job. also speaks to your talent. That, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, <laughs> I've talked to a few other artists here that were grinding the cons for years oh, and years. Yeah, yeah. But that is also the theme too, is keep in constant contact, yes. take the feedback, improve. Yeah, yeah. Like persistence Listen to criticism. is yeah. the common theme, it seems, to most of the successful that's, artists. Yeah, that, that is really helpful. Like, listen to criticism and 
and try to always improve your stuff and, and yeah like listen to what these editors are saying so so that brings us to kind of now looking at your portfolio and all the the things that you present you have a lot of you know gaming a lot of disney <laughs> yeah. a lot of pop culture Definitely. you know um, so where how do you choose the inspiration that you, yeah. you actually want to to well portray? i try like i try to only like if I'm doing fan art I try to only do it of things that I actually like so I am a pretty big gamer I love you know a lot of pop culture obviously like superhero films um, a lot of anime these are all things that inspire me and, and it's all things I like and make me want to draw like that you were saying the Spider-Verse poster earlier like I saw that movie and I loved it and I was like I just want to go home and draw all these characters because I love them so much um, so I try to just like anything that gives me inspiration that I love um, I want to do like my take on it and see like what comes out when I try to draw those characters. So would you say that kind of your your personal hobbies are like the engine that drives the, yeah, yeah. the, yeah, the art? Yeah, definitely. How do yeah. you how do you balance the, the time? Because like I, I run a business and I'm a dad yeah. and, and gaming and hobby time gets drastically really, cut yeah. into it. So how do you find that balance? It's tough, especially like working from home. I feel like every hour of the day is like a potential hour to work like you have to almost say okay at five o'clock stop and have a life and like do things that you want to do and don't draw so i always try to make time to like play video games well, well when you're driven time. there is that guilt yeah. of if i'm on the couch and yeah like isn't i could doing be something yeah. i could be doing more. exactly yeah so you know? uh, i know like I've, I've definitely consciously tried to say okay like on the weekends have a weekend like don't especially doing these cons because that eats up a lot of free weekends too but i always try to like you know have some time where i'm just not drawing and focus on things that you know other things i like to do in life too so, so how long um you know like on an 11 by 17 piece that yeah. you're doing how long would you say you have to spend doing it like uh, are you I, able to churn them out is it is it more of a, I try, a daily process yeah I, it, it definitely takes more than a day i try not to like say you know i have a time limit because i want it to be like as good as it could be but typically a piece takes me anywhere from like four to five days from like start to finish and that's like with all the different sketching then scanning it in and then doing the colors and then if it has like a lot of characters sometimes it takes a little bit over a week or something like that okay um and do you work on multiple pieces at once would you say do you have like a few going or do you want to finish you start one yeah i, need to finish I hyper this focus before. yeah okay. definitely just do like one at a time yeah i wish i could kind of multitask like that but I'm, i get so like hyper focus on one thing and then i just only focus on that one thing um and you mentioned how the cons take up a lot of your weekends yeah. uh, I know I've personally seen you at C2E2 for at least <laughs> the last four years um, yes, yeah. how do you do you enjoy the con circuit I mean do you like getting to meet the people that, that go to the Etsy shop I and, do and things it's, like that? it's like anything else like it is it does get tiring because it is a lot of travel and we go like back and forth you know east coast to west coast and back to the west coast and and it can be a lot it can be very tiring but i love doing the cons i love meeting new people especially like i'm at home i'm such a hermit like all day most of my life so i need to get out and it's so great to just get out see new places meet new people have new conversations and you know meet people that uh, tell me stories about oh my daughter's you know has all your art in her room and that stuff makes it like oh yeah this is why I'm doing what I'm doing and it, it makes it like all worth it to me. So. Um, how do you handle the you know you you are on the fairly successful end of, of the art community? <laughs> I know you're not taking commissions this weekend. You know um, there is a high demand. How do you handle that 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 stress of my fans want this but I, I only have time for that? That or, is yeah that is really tough because I do want it. I'm such a people pleaser like I do want to say yes to everyone but I also don't want to be that person that like takes a year <laughs> to get your art to you you know so I try to just like I want to also do a quality commission so I only try to really take what I know I can do in a given amount of time and I just had to teach myself like it's okay to say no uh, to people and I yeah sometimes I do disappoint them but in the end it'll make uh, you know a better piece and I don't want to just like churn out pieces just for the sake of that I want to do like a good piece so uh, I just had to learn to say no and only take like what I know I can do in, in a given amount of time. 
<laughs> um, and before we wrap up, uh, what would is uh, what are you currently working on that you want our, our listeners to know that you know to go check out? Um, yeah. Currently working on. I, I was going to say I'm about to show uh, pins that I did for Star Wars Celebration. I did over 42 pin designs, um, and I have some statues coming out with DC this summer. And always, uh, I'm always turning out new stuff. Uh, just personal work on my like on my Instagram and Facebook and, and stuff speaking like that. that where, uh, where can all the yeah. everybody find your work? And, yeah, you know, uh, I think. I think everything is really just my name, so Chrissy Zulo on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, Tumblr, and DeviantArt as well. Okay, and then you sell most of your work on a, you, an yes. Etsy account, right? Uh, yes, well, it's a store envy, so it's okay. just chrissyzulo.storeenvy.com. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, we thank you a lot for yeah, having your time. Yeah, thank you so I, much. I, I, the con's about to ramp up on a <laughs> yeah. Saturday. It's going to be yeah. so I appreciate you squeezing us Totally, today. man. It's been awesome. No, thank you very much. <laughs> there you were with Chrissy Zulo, and I know we're we're getting a little little long on time here well, make sure make sure our listeners know that chrissy has an etsy account you can go and you can purchase any of her art off her etsy account that'll be in the show yeah. notes too i really want to make sure that people go and check out her work because i i think everybody would be really pleased uh especially if you have children or if you you have a a, a wife or a girlfriend that's really into some of these pop culture things that she's drawn they make great gifts I, yeah i can't i can't speak highly enough of them. it'll be in the show notes at, at the nerdcantina.com slash show too yep. you, you'll you'll be able to find all of those uh those links no no it's a store envy store envy and we'll also have uh, some features some of our art so that way you can get an idea of what uh what what her art is and her artistic design and uh, and go out and support her go out and uh and, and and buy a piece for your for your daughter for your niece for a friend. It's uh it's worth hanging on a wall for sure. All right, and the the last interview that we uh we have for our audience today is uh with the creator and dungeon master of the TV show Dimension Twenty, Brendan Lee Mulligan. They were they had a big um section it right at the front um promoting the show, and I had I had not recently heard of the show, but it's it's on College Humor. It's brought to you by College Humor, so already that that's a big name in online video content and they had all the sets uh the game boards that they use to do the show which are all custom made um this isn't a game they don't play a game that you can purchase anywhere so they they all play a live action rpg game but it's it's a bunch of improv comedians they're just trying to tell a funny story as as they play this game there are a few other people that are doing the same thing kind of with like dungeons and dragons and other kind of games so they're not the only ones in this space but they are doing something original they are trying to tell a a demon high school story kind of game you know so they they have a unique spin on it it is on college humor's uh, subscription based channel and uh, so they were there really promoting it hard. They had all the actors there and all the sets. They really were engaging with people. He was able to carve out a, a good 10 minutes for me to to try to promote it. And I'm glad that he did. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and hear that interview. All right, folks. We're here with Brendan Lee Mulligan from Dimension 20. They were, they're on the Dropout Network, right? Yeah, that's right. They have a RPG-based board game television show. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit more about it? So, I am the Game Master for yeah. Dimension 20. Our first season, Fantasy High, is fully available on Dropout.tv. Uh, this is an actual play show with a bunch of college humor cast members, great UCB-trained comedians. Uh, and we've been having a ball this weekend at C2E2. Uh, we ran a live panel of our show. It's been truly breathtaking, all the fans that have come up and said nice things about the show. Basically, sort of our offering to the actual play sphere of a like short form anthology comedy based actual play show. So, whose uh, like brainchild is this necessarily? Was it a collective, or was it someone light bulb went off and and let's let's do a TV show based on an RPG game? It was weirdly a mutual light bulb thing going on. So RPG actual play is having a huge moment right now with the success of things like the Adventure Zone, Critical Role, across podcasting and streaming. And at the time, College Humor was initiating Dropout, which is our new subscription platform. And I had just started working there, and I had just gone full-time. I'd been hired as a cast member. I was at my desk lighting up a pitch for an actual play show when one of our executives, Adam Frucci, walked up to me and said, have you ever thought about running an actual play show here? And I literally turned my computer around. I was like, have I? <laughs> <laughs> so bizarrely, it was like 
it was it was not even like uh, creativity by committee. It was like mutual. Uh, uh, mutually arrived at from separate people all arriving at the same place and we said like yeah this is the right move so how long would you say the, the inception of it took i mean with since you were both thinking about it once you guys came together from that day to actual first show recording how long was that process uh i from conception to release was a calendar year because this came out started airing in the end of september 2018 and I went full time at College Humor in September of 2017. And a couple weeks into that, it was a conversation. I think it spent about a month, a month and a half as a conversation. I started writing up treatments. By December of 2017, we were in full fledged pre production. We like knew the setting we wanted to do. We wanted to do it in Elmville. We wanted to do our first season, Fantasy High, is sort of this like Breakfast Club meets Lord of the Rings. John Hughes style high fantasy uh, and we were filming it that February so would you say the show came first and then you guys started developing the game or did you kind of have like where, where was the game something you had in your mind and then you just slid that into the show well I've been playing this this RPG uh, since I was 10 years old you know I've been playing it for 21 years the game was something that we wanted that was sort of uh, completely, you know, synchronized with the show. So the idea was we want to have uh, a way to invite people to sit at the table with us and actually play this game. So coming up with the setting was about finding a place that our comedians could commit, play the game super hard, but still produce a really quality piece of entertainment. Now, do you ever have plans of future monetization of this version of the game, or is it just more of like a the TV show set? It's more of like a backdrop. You guys start just using these as tools to produce your quality show. We have a lot of push from fans that want merch, and they want modules. They want to be able to run this themselves. And we're really trying to figure out the best way for us to do that, primarily because for me, we are making the show uh, so quickly, and it's you know, uh, uh, it's a small team. It's myself writing the the setting and, and doing the plot sort of single handedly. It's you know, we have a great director, camera crew, production. Rick Perry and his team do all our sets and minis, but it's like a small, tight squad of people that do it. So. Uh, finding a way to give people this ancillary material is going to require some careful thought about how to do that without impeding the production of future seasons of the show. Now, did you guys give the cast their own free reign to develop their characters, or did you have kind of like an outline already drawn up and people kind of picked? Well, that sounds interesting to me. It was 100% the cast. So I came in with the setting. I had the whole world set up. I'm like, we're doing fantasy high school. Um... And then people, I think, pitched a couple multiple different characters. So, for example, one of the characters that Emily Axford first pitched was her character Moon, uh, Moonshine Sybin that she now plays on Mad Pod, right? So that was initially a pitch for the first season of Fantasy High. So the PCs, pit, uh, the players are cast, pitched a couple different character ideas. My only, you know, putting some English on the ball there was sort of voicing which of their concepts they were pitching. I was like, ooh, let's go with that one. That one sounds really exciting. Okay. So with you, uh, it being your own game, do you guys play a little loose with the rules for for entertainment purposes? Or are you guys really like, look, this is the game we developed. We're going to stay within this realm. You know, there there is a lot of entertainment value that comes with the show. So does the, uh, the game lose anything with, when it comes to entertainment? Or... I actually run the game at the table almost identically to how I run it at home. Now, I will say that as a DM, I advise DMs to adhere to the rules as much as you possibly can, with the caveat being, don't do stuff that's going to turn your game into a nightmare slog, right? Like, we we use, you know, we get kind of crunchy, especially in later seasons, we start adopting, like, concentration rules for spell casting and things like that, but... For the most part, I am of the mindset of you let something slide if you as a DM can make the call that it is a non-critical aspect of running that particular scene. So from from the show that I, I did get to watch, I, I got a big improv feel. So do, do most of you guys come from an improv background? 100%. Or does it come from gaming? All trained improvisers uh, 
But what's funny is my improv background prior to being involved with UCB was playing RPGs as a kid. So I think it's all it all bleeds into each other. How does it feel to be in the the city of Second City, where you know so many great improvs have come out? Have you had a chance to uh, check out the theater? I all, mean. Or? Well before I ever was at C2E2, I was at Second City, I was at I.O., I was at like indie improv festivals out here, I was at like this uh, Jangle Heart Circus at the Upstairs Gallery, which is like pure indie improv out in Chicago. This place is a mecca. All right, we're back from an abrupt ending there to uh, that Dimension 20 interview with Brennan Lee Mulligan. What happened there? Yeah, um, I'm still kind of new to this, and I was just using a you know my phone app with uh, the mics to record it, and we had two interviews out of what I did 16, 18 interviews. Two of them we had technical difficulties. This one, thank God, just kind of cut off the outro. You know, so as soon as he was done mentioning improv in Chicago, we kind of just wrapped it up. He, I let him promote you know where you could find Dimension Twenty at. So we're gonna have to do a good job of making sure all that's in the show notes for the audience so they can find uh, these guys. Cause they were really nice guys. I want to make sure that this is something that interests you that you guys go check it out because uh, I did watch episode one, episode one, I think is free on YouTube to watch. And uh, it's interesting. The guys are funny. They, they're having a good time and, and I, I wish them all the success in the world. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting that they put together essentially a, a collection of nerds at heart who are, improv trained people to then just to, to play up this this dungeon master dungeon game uh kind of community feel and, and put it to a tv show so if, if you're a part of that community if, you, if that's something you like to do you probably will find some enjoyment uh as as they're going to poke fun a little bit and uh and highlight some parts of of your own culture and life there yeah, and brendan was a really nice guy you know he was uh i i had to wait for the interview for about five minutes and he was talking to a group of creators that are trying to create their own comics and stuff and and he was looking at their art and talking to them like he was real supportive of of the community for you know you get a lot of these guys they get overwhelmed at the cons they don't really want to engage and all the actors all the all the people at the dimension 20 booth which was a big booth right in front of C2E2. I want to say they played the game with a lucky fan that they drew from a a pile on Saturday and actually played the game with them um, and and recorded it. So they they were really engaging, and I I felt really uh, glad to be able to promote for them. Good job with uh, the interviews that you've done so far. Uh, And that takes us to the end of Episode 2. We're excited for what we're doing here, and we've we've got more coming up, more C2E2 interviews coming up in uh, Episode 3. I think we're going to go a little more uh, intellectual nerd next episode in episode three, where we're going to play your uh, interview with Corey Doctorow. For those of you who don't know, homework assignment, go watch a YouTube video or something of him between now and the release of episode three. So you can really kind of uh, dive into the conversation that, that Steve has with him uh, and that we have on digital rights, media, intellectual property, as far as in the digital space, uh, some other conversations. It's a very tech, it's a very tech driven kind of uh, interview, which I'm sure we have a lot of fans that, that don't just immerse themselves in pop culture. And this is another aspect of the show that I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to bringing out is not just talking about movies and comics and games and stuff, but also talking about some of the more nerdy subjects that deal with, you know, technology or, you know, pop culture yeah. philosophy. And, and, like and how technology plays like all, all of our hobbies, all these hobbies we talk about, these comics and, you know, whether you're talking about books comics these tv shows they all exist in the digital realm and what Corey's talking about what he's trying to bring uh, what he's trying to highlight is is that interplay of hey digital rights and digital copyright and and the effect it's going to have and the the direction that's going um it's it's interesting it, it definitely ties if if you pay attention you could not pay attention it'll have no impact on you and your your hobbies but uh, <laughs> in the end it's somewhere down the road the internet may be broken in the 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 space uh that the direction is heading your your products your content the things you enjoy may may not be uh, available to you in the way you want it to be yeah let's all be real i mean everybody's on facebook everybody uses these technologies that we talk about and they affect your life in some way shape or form you know so to have these conversations is good and if you're not too into that that aspect we hope you still listen and, and you uh, you maybe learn a few things that maybe piques your interest uh, that way. Um, he does promote his book, Radicalized, which is uh, four short stories that, that spread the gamut of doomsday kind of tech worlds, in, in my opinion. 
Um, and he talks about that for a little bit. But, no, I'm really excited. That was one of the, the better interviews I think I was able to get and do that weekend because I truly had a, a great interest in what he was talking about. I was, I was really happy to just ask a few questions and then sit there and listen to him talk for, for 20 minutes. Yeah, well, uh, it's a wrap for episode two. I, I just want to thank you all for uh, for listening here to episode two. Steve and I, we, we continue to hope that you have enjoyed uh, this episode as well as episode zero and one. And if you haven't had the chance to listen to those or this is the first one that you've uh, gone and downloaded, uh, we'd ask that you go back and listen to them. It, it really kind of starts to paint the picture of what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, some of the interviews, some of the content we're trying to bring to you and the conversations we're, uh, we're trying to have. If you are enjoying it, please subscribe uh, and, and leave a review. It'll help us become more visible to, uh, to others and, and further the reach of this audience and uh, further the reach of the conversations we're trying to have. If you have suggestions, if you don't like what we're doing so far, hey, send us a suggestion. Uh, reach out to, to me at Ken at the nerdcantina.com or any of our uh, social media platforms. You'll find us at the Nerd Cantina. And we, we'd love to, to take it for action some of the suggestions you have and start to really push this, this show uh, in the directions that you want to hear. So again, thank you very much for listening. And uh, enjoy your week. Good day. See you later, nerds.